Good morning. So I had, you probably got that email. I talked to the director of College 101 and uh, she said, yeah, it was, you were still supposed to go to your class. There was one class that decided to excuse, I guess choir. And um, I honestly can't afford to just lose a day. And so I like, I think most, almost everybody else did not cancel. Well, first of all, they never even told us about it. I only found out about it through you guys. And by the way, that was a good clue because they hadn't contacted us. That was a pretty big clue that they didn't expect us to. You know what I mean? If they were going to ask us to give up class, then they certainly would have talked to us. You follow? If I was going to ask somebody else to give up class because I wanted to have my students longer, I would have to go talk to them about it. And they never did that. Anyway, I know the bad news is you guys have to what? Make it up? But, but at least they have a way of doing that, I guess. So, okay. So, last time was what? <laughs> Shifting, yep. Being uh, vertically, horizontally, and then we did the stretching and the squishing thing all together. I was hope it should have been a little bit on the lighter side, I'm thinking, I'm hoping. And I got a bunch of things to do today, so I'm going to maybe take a few less questions, but let's go ahead and open it up to questions. Yes, 29. So describe the transformation and then sketch its graph. All right, well, let's just, let's just do this uh, orally if possible. <coughs> Hopefully you all saw that it had to be an absolute value function at its root, right? But we also noted that it was what? Shifted to the left, you know, inside the absolute value sign, so you see a plus four. So that tells us what? Shifted to the left, four. Then the negative sign tells me it's upside down. So instead of the V opening up, it opens downward. And then finally it's what? Pushed up eight units. So it's a good old absolute value that's flipped upside down, moved to the left four and up eight. And then you just kind of go sketch that. Yes. Um, so does that make sense, Heidi? Okay. Yes. Inside the parentheses or the whatever, in this case, uh, absolute value, that tells you left or right. Yes. A plus? It's kind of like, what, the opposite. The plus tells you left, the minus tells you right. But outside, it tells you vertically, and plus is up, and minus is down. Just like you'd expect it to be. So, I kind of think of it this way. Inside is horizontal and opposite. Outside is vertical and normal. I don't know if that helps. Inside multiply. Yeah. Um, First of all, it's inside, so it's going to be horizontal. And, well, it's, yeah. So, like you're taking the x-coordinate, you're first doubling it before you do anything else. But, so, when it's like, at the back, then you can you double the x-coordinate? You're doubling the number yes. before you calculate. Yes. So what effect will that have? It actually, see, normally multiply <laughs> stretches. Only multiply by a number over uh, one. It stretches. But because this is inside, the opposite. And multiplying by a number over one actually shrinks it horizontally. So it's going to do this. Yes. Then, are you going to the outside? When it's on the outside, it's a 
vertical thing. And if it's a number above one, we're pulling it vertically up. And if it's a number less than one, it's doing it. Yes, make it. 43. So write an equation that does the following. It's the absolute value, but it's moved 10 up and reflected in the x-axis. What's that reflected in the x-axis thing mean? It's like upside down. So that's going to be just a good old minus sign that's going to do that. And then, now i got to make sure i got the order right. It's the shape of the absolute value, but move 10 units up and reflect it in the x-axis. Well, if we follow their order, it would be plus 10 and then a minus sign over the whole thing, which would actually make it down. I'm having a little trouble knowing if I follow strictly their order. Well, the back of the book says negative 10. Yeah. Yeah. So here's what they did. See, they if you follow their order, they said this. We know it's an absolute value of x. Okay, the fact that it's flipped upside down tells me this. And then it's, uh, no, they said first moved up 10. Excuse me. First moved up 10, and then flipped upside down or reflected. So what is that? And that's why they have a minus. So if it's reflected on the so you, or the y, you have to... Yeah. So it was, I know, you look at it and you go, wait a minute, it moved up 10? What's this minus 10 thing? It's because at the very end they said, okay, flip it. So the order and how they... The order is important. Yeah. Had they said, flip it, and then move it up 10, then the 10 would have had to been positive. So if you see minus, that's the value that minus 10, and you have to write out what it looks like? Yeah, you don't want to, the, the thing I don't like about this is it's kind of like not carried out all the way. You want to, yeah, yeah, it's like unfinished. Because if you saw minus, that's the value of x minus 10, I guess I would just automatically assume it's reflected and it's down. So how and honestly, the bottom line is that what you just said is okay. If you're not worried about order, you're right. It's flipped upside down and moved down 10. And they could have described this problem that way, too. Uh, it all depends. Yeah, that's, that's a little bit touchy and it all depends on order. I don't... So that's what it is. Well, it was moved up 10 before they reflected it. So they did move it up 10. But then when you reflect over the x-axis, something that's up 10 is going to wind up down 10. You see? That's what's a little bit tricky about it. So they actually did move it up 10, and then they said, oh, we're vacating this area because we're going to do the mirror image below the x-axis. A little bit tricky there. I don't think they were trying to trick you, but that's what was going on. Yep. Um, I have a couple of graphs on the side. Hog G? Yeah. <coughs> Let's see what we got. <coughs> 5G. One half X. Okay, let's discuss it first of all. Oh, well, first of all, what was the function? It was just what? What's there? It, that, that's just the one that's drawn, right? Okay. So how do you do this one-half x inside parentheses? All right. First of all, it's inside parentheses that tells me it's something horizontal. Now, horizontal works opposite of vertical. When you have a number between 0 and 1, that's actually going to expand it instead of shrinking it. So it actually expands it horizontally. 
And so what you're actually going to do is make your slot twice as wide. Okay, so you would just double each. Actually, it causes me to double the X coordinate. Okay. Yeah, so it's like, mm -hmm. you just pull the graph like this and make it twice as wide. So when you're... <laughs> and so then, like, when you vertically section it, can you look at stuff? Like, so the vertical rule is, all right, part C. Now it's C, yeah, double that first. Yeah. Now you're doing this. You're taking every Y coordinate and you're doubling it. So you have to stretch it vertically. Okay. You, you, double, you don't double both coordinates. No. Okay. You mean on C? Yeah, I'm on both. Uh, well, we got to talk about one at a time, but they, okay. they kind of conflict. Okay. But uh, part C, where it says two times f of x, that just leaves all the x coordinates untouched okay. and takes all the y coordinates and goes away. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. And G, you are actually doubling the x coordinates, but leaving the y coordinates exactly the way they were. Okay. Yes. is actually shrinking this way. Yes. So you're actually in effect taking uh, one fourth of all your exports where you're leaving your large board and one cut. Yeah. Okay, maybe one more. <laughs> all right. Well let's here's two six. Taking functions and combining them in different ways. Now, some of this is incredibly easy this time. And some of it's a little bit more challenging, but none of it should be totally new to you. Um, yeah, what, I, what I'm going to do is just use, I just made these up. I said, let's say function f is 2x minus 5. Could have made up anything. But just to get it started, I'm going to say function f is take what I give you, double it, and subtract 5. And I'm going to say rule g is take what I give you, multiply it by 4, and add 1. Okay, so I just made up two rules, f and g. Now, one way to combine functions is to take rules f and g and add them. Just literally take f of x plus g of x. By the way, this is sometimes written like this. I'm not always totally fond of this notation, but you've got to be able to, when you see it, you've got to know what's going on. So this can sometimes be written this way. This means the same as that. This is totally clear, right? f of x plus c of x, but this might take a little bit of getting used to. But it's, it's out there, so I, had, I have to show it to you. Well, how do you think we add rule f and g? Well, that's simple. Just add the two polynomials. And that's incredibly easy to do. It's called gather like terms. And you wind up with 6x minus 4. I mean, there's no problem there, right? So we can, sometimes you're going to add the f to combine two functions by adding them. And likewise, this is just about as easy. Sometimes you'll be asked to subtract two functions. So we could say f of x minus c of x. The uh, new shortcut way to say that sometimes is f minus c of x. Means the same thing. Now the only thing you got to be a little bit careful of is carrying out your minus sign. Some people still forget to subtract the one. I think sometimes they're in a hurry and that happens. So anyway, this becomes minus 4, minus 1. Again, gather my terms. Okay, that's algebra 1 and stuff. That's not very hard. Okay. Any, there's nothing mysterious there, right? You can also multiply or divide two functions. And so keeping the same two guys that I had before, you can take f of x times g of x, or f times g of x. Well, watch out for this notation, because 
that F dot is like a multiplication dot. A little later, they make the dot a little bit bigger and they open it up and it means something totally different. It means composed. The only thing, I, that's why I'm not thrilled about that notation. But anyway, be real careful with it. I'll show you when we get to composing in a minute. So how do we multiply two polynomials? Well, that's no big deal either. That's called handshaking. You know how to do that. Gather like terms. And then finally, how about dividing two functions? Taking the same two guys and dividing f of x by g of x, which can be symbolized this way. f divides f, f slash g of x. Well, I can't even do anything here, can I? I can't cancel. So it's like, I'm done. Except, if you're a good algebra student, you're going to want to say something about domain over here. And you realize that you don't want that denominator ever to have the possibility of being zero. So that's what I'm doing over here. I'm saying, boy, when could that denominator be zero? I don't want it to be equal to zero. And the only time it would be equal to zero is when x would be negative one-fourth. Okay, therefore I have to say x cannot be negative one-fourth. Do you follow why I did this? You want to start getting into the habit of doing that type of thing. And, uh, so here's my result, but x cannot be negative one fourth. So usually just a comma followed by that kind of a statement. Again, though, there doesn't appear to be anything very complicated here, right? So, so the four ways to combine two functions are good old arithmetic operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Then there's what we call composition, composing two functions. And so I kept, I'm, I, I just got hung up on those two functions, but they're nice and simple and they at least give us a nice example. So keeping those same two guys, now what is f of g of x? And I should have written it on here and I didn't. I'm going to do it right now. There is another notation for this, too, and I should have used what? Yeah, I don't know. I'll use black this time. Um, this could be written. Um, I, I almost detest this notation. Um, if it looks foggy, I think it is, personally. Uh, I just don't like that because it looks so much like f dot g of x. But anyway, that little old kind of raised open circle stands for compose. F compose G of X. This is my preferred. You're, you're not going to see me use this one on a test. You'll see me write it like this. I might say, what is F of G of X? And I'll write it like this. And you get the idea here. The inner parentheses are rounded and the outer ones are brackets. So, Here's how I like to think of it. What is rule uh, What is rule F, since it's the outer rule? It says take whatever I give you, multiply it by 2, and subtract 5. Take whatever I give you, double it, and subtract 5. Okay, now I'm going to give you this. All right, take it, double it, and subtract 5. Of course, you can simplify that. Now, this can get confusing, but now let's do g of f of x. So this time the outer function is take whatever I give you, quadruple it, and add 1. Okay, I'm going to give you 2x minus 5, the, the f rule. Quadruple it and add 1. Please, please, please notice f of g of x is not equal to g of f of x. Okay, most of the time that's what's going to happen. They're not going to be equal. There are some special times when they are. Um, and I'll, I might as well spill the beans. It's from the next section, but who knows? When is it that f of g of x will equal g of f of x? 
when F and G have a special relationship, anyone, anybody, anybody want to make a guess? There's something the same about them. They're inverses of each other. When they're inverses of each other, they never work. If they're not inverses of each other, like here, you notice these are not at all the same. Okay. So, yeah, uh, by the way, the next section is inverses, and so, yeah, that's where we're headed. Actually, it's not part of this lesson. Here's a little bit, a little bit more complicated one. This time, rule F is take what I give you, square it, add on three times the number, and then add one. And rule G is take what I give you, cube it, and subtract none. And then what I do on the rest of this page is I do, all right, what is f of g of x? And down here below the black line, what is g of f of x? So there's a lot of horsing around. Rule f, take what I give you and square it. Then take it, add to it three times what I give you and add one. So in this one, what am I giving them? I'm giving them x cubed minus 9. So I have to square it, I have to triple it, and then I have to add one just a little bunch, you know, some handshaking, get the common terms together. Down here, g of f of x. So this time I'm doing, take what I give you and cube it and subtract 9. Okay, now I've got to take this crazy thing and cube it. That's the, the what, the icky part of this problem. I have to take that trinomial and multiply it by itself three times. So here's what I did. I hammered out twice. And then, yeah, it's a little hard to tell what I all did there. What did I do? Yeah, well, I'm not even done yet. Oh, uh, here it is. This is just the cube part, uh, the squared part, isn't it? Yeah, now I'd have to take that and multiply it by this again get all of that together, and then finally subtract them. So this is only partially done. Does everybody see what's going on there? And it's just what? A whole bunch of multiplying and adding and... Okay. So once again, well, I know you don't know just by looking at it, but will these two come out the same? Only if? They're inverses of each other, and they're, they're, they're not. Okay. Yeah, and here I just talk about this uh, fog notation. I kind of detest it, but you're going to see it in the book. This means the same as this. This is what you'll see for me, but you're going to see this in literature, and you'll see it in the book. you got to know what it means. Sometimes we have a function that's composed of more than two things. And part of the assignment, they're going to give you things like this and say, can you break this into its individual chunks? So it's kind of like the inner function here is kind of like the x minus 2, the inside parentheses. And then what's the next thing we did to that x minus 2? We squared it. And then what's the last thing we did to that thing? We took the cube root. So, look, so here's how I wrote it out. All right, let's say f is this inner guy, x minus 2. Let's say rule g is take whatever you have in parentheses and square it. And then the last rule is take whatever you've got and take it to cube root. So in a way, isn't this just h of g of f of x? So you start with the inner one in the middle and you work your way out. So you're going to be asked, I think, in the assignment to do a little bit of that, too. Yeah, and every once in a while, they'll actually have you compose the function with itself. Okay. They'll actually have you do f compose f, or f of f of x. And that's going to look a little strange to you. f of f of x. So, Rule F says, take, take what I give you, 
squared and add 1. Okay, now I'm going to give you x squared plus 1. So take that x squared plus 1, square it, and add 1. And then, so there is such a thing as composing something with itself. And it's not the same as square, okay? Did you see that? Let's take a look at number one on page 234, where they have you do some playing around on a graph. Okay, I copied the graphs that they have in the book, the black and the blue. My black is the F function, my blue is the G function. And in number one, they say, find F plus G of X. Okay, now, we've never done this from this point of view before, so this is kind of an important exercise. Really, all you do is add the Y coordinates. So for example, I don't know exactly where we are here. I'm assuming this is a negative one, that's a one, and that's a two. Is that the way it is in the book? Yeah. Okay. So what's negative one plus two? One. So that red dot is my answer to the end to the sum of those two. What's zero plus three? Red dot is three. Okay, next dot. What's one half plus one, one and a half, or approximately so. And down here, what's zero plus whatever this is? It's uh, right at that same number. So do you see, if uh, on a graph, how do you do f plus g of x? You just literally keep the x coordinates the same, you add the y coordinates. Now I thought that was valuable to see. So you can actually see here that the black is f, the blue is G, and the red is F plus G. You're going to have you do a little bit of that in the beginning. Let's go through number six, too. And in, in the, uh, number six in the book, they say, find F plus G of X, find F minus G of X, find F times G of X, and find F divided by G of X. And tell me, what is the domain of f divided by g of x? Well, okay, one at a time. Here's f, here's g. So what's f plus g of x? Just add them together. 2x plus negative x is x. Negative 5 plus 2 is negative 3. So x minus 3. What's f minus g of x? That guy minus that guy. Don't forget to carry out the minus through the whole thing. So you wind up with what? 2x plus x? 3x and negative 5 minus 2, negative 7. And we got a multiplication. And finally we have a division. And I'm going to roll just a bit so we can see that a little bit better. Um, there's no calculating to do on part B, or is there? Well, here's the answer. It's just one thing divided by the other. What they said, remember, find the domain. So you've got to say to yourself, what can I not have happen here? I can't have a 2 down here, because if that was a 2, that would create a 0. So i got to say that. X cannot be 2. So there's your domain. Usually it's best to handle it just with a comma and then state what uh, what you can't have. Now let's take a look at number 18. A little different. It says F is X squared plus 1. G is X minus 4. 
evaluate the indicated function. Okay, well, number 18 says, find f plus g of p minus 2. What in the world does that mean? Well, what does f plus g mean? It means add the two functions together. All right, so I did that first right up here. So take these two guys and add them together. That was pretty easy, right? So now, isn't this f plus g of x? Now I ask you, what's f plus g of p minus 2? Now this is old stuff. What's this all of p minus 2 stuff? Isn't that saying that's what they want us to substitute in? Place of x? That's exactly what it's saying. So now I just take this, and everywhere there's an x, I stick a p minus 2 in there. So, x squared, p minus 2 squared. Plus x, p minus 2. Minus 3. So, I know when you first look at this problem, it looks like, what? There's just like too much going on. Just remember, first find the f plus b of x. Then, all right, if you know f plus b of x, how can you find f plus b of anything else? Just make the substitution. So there's a little bit of that going on there. <coughs> yeah, I don't, let's just take a look at 26. Um, 26 says, graph the functions f, g, and f plus g on the same graph. Well, I got it done already, so let me just show you what went on there. So, in number 26, f of x was one-third x. How do you graph one-third x? Well, isn't one-third your slope? And since there's nothing added onto it, aren't they telling us that the y-intercept is zero? So do you see why my blue line, number one, goes to the origin? And then, do I have my slope right? Well, if I did it right, now you can't even see my unit. It's funny how sometimes the vertical lines don't show up on this projector. They do on mine. This is uh, 1, 2, 3. So that first blue point there is over 3 and up 1. Rise of 1, a run of 3, you can see the slope of 1 third. Okay, uh, what's g of x? g of x is negative x plus 4. So the slope is negative 1 and the y-intercept is 4. So you notice how in my g function, the black one, I go through the point 0, 4, the y-intercept. My slope is negative 1. So for my rise of 4, I have a run of, well, actually my rise is negative 4, it's a negative rise. So it's negative 4 over 4, slope negative 1. So that's the black one. So now what happens when you add those two together? You don't have to do this. I guess we could do it on the graph. So let's just add the points. What's 0 plus 4? 4. Red point. What's 1 plus 2? Oh, sorry. Where am I? Blue. What's 1 plus 1? That's black plus blue. 1 plus 1 is 2. Red point. Um, Anyway, you can keep going like that. Actually, I've done enough. Already we have enough. Or, if you don't want to do it graphically, can't you just take the two functions and add them together? What happens when you add them together? You get what? Negative 2 thirds x plus 4? How did I do that? I added 1 third x to negative 1 x. Wouldn't that be a negative 2? If you add 1 third positive to a negative 1, don't you get a negative 2 thirds? So negative 2 thirds x plus 4. The y-intercept is 4. Slope is negative 2 thirds. And you know, if you look, that's what the red line has. So there's more than one way to do these. So you're going to have some problems like this where if you can color code them, it would help. Or if you want to use a dashed line for one and a dotted line for another and a solid line for your third, that will work, too. So um, I've got a shorter, a little bit shorter assignment for you this time. 
it's uh, 1 to 49 every other odd. That's 1 through 49. Every other odd, the old 